U.S. boots on the ground may be coming soon to Gaza. Congress overwhelmingly passes the TikTok ban. Some counts against Trump are dropped in Georgia. And more of today's top stories. The Monica Perez Show starts now. Hey, y'all. Thanks for listening. If you want to hear this show live and on video without commercial interruptions in its entirety every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. Pacific and 5 p.m. Eastern, you can tune into a variety of video platforms, rockfin.com slash Monica Perez, Rumble, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, across the board. And if you want to hear it in its entirety, commercial free on a podcasting platform, you can subscribe to Monica Perez Show Premium on iTunes. And just generally, you can hear it with commercials, which is very supportive. I appreciate that on your favorite podcasting platform. So tune in. Uh, that usually pops up just a couple of hours later. So look for that. And if you do listen free, please do me a favor, subscribe, and also leave me a review. That would be great. Okay, so today's show, I have to say, is going to be basically entirely out of my print journal. Thank goodness I get it, because there was insane wind around my house today. This my new old house, the house we got last year, but it's like a hundred years old almost. And it was so crazy windy. It was scary and the power went out for a while. So I just had to analyze the actual news out of the newspaper, but it made me think of like, what's the biggest problem I have with, I actually trademarked a term today, new weather, <laughs> capital N, capital W, new weather trademark, because they mess with the weather. And so you would think a house that was almost 100 years old would have no unvetted issues. It could tolerate anything that could happen any 100 years. But now that we have new weather, I actually wonder if they're pushing the boundaries of what's happened in this spot ever before. So I was a little freaked out by that. My dogs couldn't eat their breakfast, which is like, <laughs> that only happens when the world is actually about to end. Um, anyway, but I think I did a pretty good job and I did tune in. I did get back up and running, um, earlier in the afternoon. So let's, uh, let's get to the top story, which is that in today's journal, there were in the print journal, there were four different articles about the plight of the Palestinians. And when I got online, I found two more from today. Well, one was about the plight of the Palestinians and the most recent one, breaking news, basically, Chuck Schumer is calling for elections in a democratically elected country. Well, actually, I dispute that it is, but he's suggesting, urging Israel to have another election. And he's saying that Netanyahu is not the guy for the job and this action does not represent Israel. I think I foreshadowed this, that they were going to blame it on Netanyahu, it was Netanyahu's war. And he's saying, this guy's got to go. Now, I actually think that explains why Netanyahu is there in the first place. He lost three elections, if I'm not mistaken. He certainly didn't win uh, enough to be prime minister. He had to horse trade with, I think it was Bernie Gantz and actually another guy. I don't know who will take his place, but I can't help but think that he is in this position to do this incredibly unpopular, uh, an atrocious thing. It's probably getting him somewhat out of his corruption trouble and he'll step aside and and Israel will not have to own what happened here. And maybe they don't. I mean, they had they were having massive protests against his policies already. So that's what I think Schumer is about and part of the atrocity thing. But more to the point of what was happening today, I feel like those those stories were about getting boots on the ground in U.S. boots on the ground in Gaza, because Tuesday we talked about how they were putting a port off of Gaza and a temporary port and they would just shuttle stuff back and forth, but no boots on the ground. But I was like, yeah, that's a foothold. And as Dean said, soon to be a stronghold. And I thought I foreshadowed this, but but they just like unleashed the propaganda. And I thought it was interesting 
the the headlines alone as you read through them like show the evolving propaganda story and the next headline is you know human it isn't there yet but i anticipate a washington a wall street journal headline that says uh u.s boots on the ground in um uh, gaza for humanitarian reasons so here are i'm going to read you the headlines one after the other the full headlines which are not always in the print version they're they're from the uh online version because they're longer diaper prices up 600 percent inflation and cash shortages compound pain in gaza palestinians are draining savings and struggling to get cash to pay for the limited food and essentials available and that's okay so they're desperate they're desperate for essentials get um cash food gaza airdrops take huge effort and don't solve hunger crisis sending aid by plane is costly dangerous and inadequate with aid groups saying only large-scale truck deliveries can prevent famine so we've been dropping aid and it's just not enough they need trucks oh under pressure to stave off famine israel vows to boost aid into gaza Israel military says it will coordinate with the U.S. on the sea corridor as Netanyahu faces calls internally and from allies to do more. And now it says aid trucks trickle into northern trickle into northern Gaza as Israel opens new routes. Israel allows in six trucks with United Nations rations for 25,000 people as international pressure intensifies. Okay, there's one more one more um, headline, but that's of a different nature. Those are all saying that um, that what we're doing right now, like the port, the airdrops, even Israel giving the green light to the UN is not adequate for several reasons. But the main reason, first of all, it's like actually just they have to cover distance and these places are war torn. They, some of these articles said that when they drop airdrop the food, It'll hit people, the parachute won't open, they don't coordinate with the Palestinians, which really doesn't make sense. <laughs> I don't see why they don't, they do on other things. And that it's not enough anyway, it's nowhere, it's only a fraction of how much trucks could bring in and what the trucks are bringing in is only a fraction of what's needed. And that even though Israel said that the UN could get in, they can't actually make the deliveries because the convoys get converged upon by the locals as they enter these un, um, these starving territories. And as we saw last week, obviously we know now why this got so much press. The Israeli military killed 100 people and wounded hundreds more as desperate people converged on the convoy. And the impression that they're starting to get is that uh, Israel is, isn't up to the task. They can't handle it. They cannot handle it. Like those guys kind of panicked or they're opening these aid corridors, but they're not able to give the convoys point to point security. So the convoys can't get through. And that's where the last uh, headline comes in. Palestinians describe beatings, stress positions and other alleged abuses in Israeli detention. Former Gazan detainees said they were physically assaulted forced to kneel for up to 20 hours a day, sometimes with hands tied above their heads. So these are atrocities that Israel is committing that is being published <laughs> like one after the other in the Wall Street Journal. So you have to realize that the Wall Street Journal is generally very pro-Israel. So there has to be a reason for this propaganda. And that article talks about the terrible civil rights abuses that are being visited upon these people six months and they're allowed to be detained for six months or have been detained without calling their lawyers without um they can't communicate with their families and this i think is and and the excuse is that israel is so desperate to get their hostages out now i don't know how many hostages came out for a while there hamas was saying there are no more hostages um the most number the biggest number of hostages from the beginning was a couple of hundred but they are detaining and killing, you know, they're killing tens of thousands. They're detaining many, many people who are not accused of these crimes, but they just want to get information. So this is being painted as Israel is so desperate for information. They are doing, I mean, there's even a quote in one of the articles, like what else, you know, what can we do? We're just doing our best and we're not getting the information we need and we're violating these people's rights, but what can you do? 
So it's all just begging the U.S. to intervene for two reasons, for the humanitarian reason of being physically capable of getting food to these people, and then also this idea that Israel needs help. They cannot fix this on their own. And then now Schumer comes in over the top and says it's really Netanyahu's fault. It's, it's an administrative problem. So Biden says, actually literally said that the U.S. is going to do more. And this was like weird. There, there were some quotes I pulled out of here. And these were two back-to-back -back articles, I think on the same page in the journal, maybe A6. It said, Palestinian health authorities say 27 people, mostly children, have died from malnutrition and dehydration. That was in the humanitarian article. And then in the um, civil rights article, it was 27 Palestinians from Gaza have died in Israeli detention since October 7th. You know, I feel like they do a survey like, what is the number that catches people's eyes the most? And it's like 27. <laughs> um, uh, another, this is just an interesting quote. It said um, that just this is just atrocity stuff. It said, Palestinian, photos of Palestinians stripped to their underwear are deeply disturbing. You've probably seen those in the past. And now we know why. It's to get us ginned up to go in and rescue them. And what that will do is give us a foothold. And it also says in that article, like the, one of the, the person, the featured person they led with was an EMT. Like, so an ambulance worker. This is not a Hamas soldier. He's not even accused of being a Hamas soldier. So I'm not saying that any of this stuff isn't true. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying this is what, whether it's propaganda of the deed or it's whatever it is, it's meant to tee us up for boots on the ground. And they keep talking about the two-state solution. So this boots on the ground thing isn't going to be temporary until the hunger problem is fixed there. This, um, this entire issue, the uh, extreme conditions of the people in Gaza wouldn't even have happened I'm, I, I think there's a chance without the blockade of Gaza from the beginning. So Israel did not allow Gaza to trade with the outside world by blocking their um, the port of Gaza or whatever, their access by, by water. So the humanitarian crisis could have been solved way before, and it will not be solved in any kind of organic way without these external forces uh, in the few, what I'm saying is, it's not like the humanitarian aid that, that we're talking about here is going to just drop in, fix the problem, and leave. They're not actually fixing the problem. They're just going to bring the food, and there is no fix to that problem while they still have a blockade and this other stuff. So it's going to be a permanent thing. It's going to be nation building. You know, and I fear that as well for Yemen and Haiti. Now, I'm going to actually talk to Danny Shaw who knows a lot about Haiti. We're gonna talk at four o'clock Pacific, seven o'clock Eastern here tonight, Thursday, see what's going on in Haiti because it is going crazy there. But these are places that are all talking, you know, they haven't said it about Yemen yet, but Haiti is definitely, we might be there already. I don't know, I haven't checked the newspaper, like it, they, or it's not in the newspaper yet, but it, it, we may be there already. Um, and Ukraine too. Macron said we need, you know, NATO boots on the ground there. We'll probably let Europe take that one. But, you know, this is starting to get physical and very scary. Let me see if I missed anything. Oh, yeah, there was another thing um, that added to the whole humanitarian crisis, but Israel's in over its head. They bombed, Israel bombed a food distribution center yesterday and somebody was killed. They're saying that was a Hamas operative who was there getting food from the food distribution center to Hamas soldiers. The Palestinians are horrified because they share the coordinates of food distribution centers with Israel and that like backfired because they were doing it so they would avoid the target instead they targeted it. So it makes Israel look overzealous, incompetent, in over its head and and pinning it on Netanyahu. I just think it's all coming together what this what this narrative is. OK, uh, next big item front page news today was that Congress has passed the bill that, you know, people say in shorthand bans TikTok. 
they passed it 352 to 65. That's in the House. So it has to go to the Senate. And uh, if it does get through the Senate, I mean, I think Schumer decides whether they vote on it or not. That's a big power. But if it does, uh, it would definitely be changed. Senator Rand Paul is against it, for example, in its current form. There are issues. So I didn't. So this is just in the news. I haven't done a deep dive on this or anything. So I'm not. I don't know what the latest ban TikTok bill is, but the way it's described in the news is that it's that TikTok could not be carried on U.S. platforms, App Store, whatever, if it is still owned by ByteDance. And I assume they, yeah, it just it's a Chinese entity, Chinese guy. It needs to not be owned by them. And what Rand Paul said is the way it's written, like it, there would not be an easy way to divest this U.S. operation from the overall platform. It ignores the fact that TikTok has done a lot to secure data. TikTok says there's no evidence that they've ever given up data. I'm, <laughs> I wonder <laughs> if ByteDance could just go public, 100% public, like the guy who owns it could just cash out and then it would just be public and uh, you wouldn't have to dice it up. However, <laughs> another piece of breaking news came across the wire today. Mnuchin, I think they call him Mnuchin, Mnuchin. I don't know, but he was the treasury secretary. I knew someone named Mnuchin. That's how we used to call him in my town. But anyway, he's putting together a group to buy TikTok. And I just, I just think that's, I mean, he's also putting together a group to buy a commercial real estate firm that's um, flirting with bankruptcy in New York. He's doing that shoulder to shoulder, like in partnership, I think, with George Soros. I, few, I tweeted that a few days ago. He, he, if you look that, I really liked that movie. I shouldn't have, but I did with The Rock and Kevin Hart called Central Intelligence. Well, if you look at the credits, he, Mnuchin, Mnuchin, whatever, is the is a producer of that, if not the executive producer, which means he's the money guy there. So in my mind, he is the perfect nexus of, of the government, media, and corporations. So he, this is just perfect for that. But what I realized is, so I was thinking, well, what they say is uh, they are accusing TikTok of what they're saying is we're afraid you're going to share user data with the Chinese government. And they're saying, no, we never have and we never will. Now, I don't know how you can say you never will, because and this is what I was thinking. I was like, because our companies do it with us. As soon as we ask, they just they capitulate whether this is public knowledge or not. I think we all know it's true. And then I thought that's the problem with TikTok. Not that they would share it with China, is that they wouldn't share it with us. That is the problem, in my opinion. So I was thinking, are they going to give it to Meta? Are they just going to shut it down and let Insta rise to take its place? But then I saw that Mnuchin wanted it, and he's a media guy. Uh, that's perfect. And it his quote, there was a quote in the article about him, really irritated me. This should be owned by a U.S. business, he said. There's no way that the Chinese would ever let a U.S. company own something like this in China. So uh, what's wrong with that statement? <laughs> Is it the Chinese legal system, the Chinese law, the Chinese whatever equivalent of, con of a constitution, our standard? This reminds me of when we, they were pulling that stuff about Russia. They were saying, well, with our kind of freedoms, we can never compete with Russia. We need to, you know, this pesky democracy. Please don't get me started. We don't have a democracy. Uh, it is pesky. <laughs> But it's also um, infuriating for somebody who really was a high-ranking government official to think that Chinese law is what we should pivot to for anything from business practices to media censorship. So that's pretty annoying. Uh, to the extent, like when you hear ban TikTok, like teen, mo you know, moms of teens around the country could, might breathe a sigh of relief. But it's not at all about, about what's so awful about social media, what's really 
brings tears to my eyes how awful it is because it's not these aren't these aren't standards that are being applied across the board to social media and by the way i don't even want that i just want the ability to curate this stuff uh Anyway, I'm not going to get into that right now. Maybe I should, but I'm not going to get into that right this second. It's not about national security or privacy. We don't have privacy. They are not a proven national security risk. It reminds me very much like the chip manufacturing thing. They've been calling that national security for probably 10 years. But if you go back and back and back, and I finally found it, prior to this current era, they used to talk about the chip manufacturing thing from a purely competitive, like corporate competitive situation, like U.S. companies cannot compete with Chinese companies on this. And then you saw, and, you know, that doesn't get any traction here because that's not, you know, our ideology. So then they started saying it was national security stuff. But it's really, in my opinion, just pure, like not pure protectionism, but largely protectionism for the oligopolies, the tech oligopolies here but also a kind of meta competition, not meta, <laughs> let's say, a, you know, an overarching competition profile. Like they don't want China to have the AI, the chips that are great for AI. That's for sure. Like that um, is what Taiwan is all about. I did a deep dive on that one of my first. Uh, so it's, it's not about that. It's about money. It's about power. It's about the you know, our corporations versus theirs. It's about technocracy because a lot of this stuff from AI to TikTok and whatever, it's it's about controlling things that you and I don't really understand. We can't write these regulations. We wouldn't know to vote on them. It's about a government that can no longer be defined by our constitution. Like that is part of what's happening here. We create half the tech for this. So our government has put us in a position where we have technology that has not emerged organically and cannot hasn't brought with it the kind of tools and culture that that can help us navigate it for our children emerge too quickly. And um, so it's causing problems and people are afraid of it. And that opens the door to this kind of wholesale regulation. It is also about censorship. So a big problem they have is how it, how it curates news and content for the, the users both with respect to what they call sensitive issues or something like that, like suicide or whatever, but also politics. And here's another big thing that's a huge problem to me uh, for this, is that if they cut this out so you don't get sources of foreign news, I worry about things like RT. Now, that's Russian propaganda for sure, but you get more information, you get more facts that you wouldn't otherwise get. And when our completely controlled, censored and compliant, complicit media spews out complete crap. You have the facts provided by Russia Today, for example. And what that does is it keeps the US media from really going overboard. But if you banned any access to external news the way they do in China or the way we are told they do in China, then our media would get even worse. And that's a big, big problem with this, in my opinion. Uh, let's see. I don't want to. I don't want to forget anything. I forgot something last time about Boeing. That's really important now. So that's why I'm like making sure I get all my notes. Uh, they some some politicians express concern that they don't want to interfere with a company's business practices. Now, actually, I have to brush up on this, but if I recall correctly, if the government does actually cost you big money by interfering with your business practices, that's a taking. And they they might be liable for it, but I doubt they would apply that to a foreign company. Um, Trump is kind of flip-flopping on this. He wanted to ban it when he was in office and actually to take the pressure off, TikTok did capitulate. And instead of selling themselves to Oracle, which is what I think Trump was pushing for before or behind the scenes, they gave Oracle a huge cloud contract. So, I mean, that's just, that's just blatant. I'm going to call that corruption, but the way, you know, I, I also think that <laughs> there's a lot of fascism in here anyway. So, but let me um, skip down to the Boeing thing and then we'll take some comments and we'll talk about Trump and I have some other stories if we have time. So 
so there was an article in yesterday's news about Boeing customers like Southwest Airlines, United Airlines. They're, uh, I don't, I don't know if they're getting spooked or if they're just gearing up for Boeing not delivering and they're taking more Airbus planes. They're reducing their flight schedules. They're reducing the number of pilots and flight attendants they're going to hire. Um, and one of the comments I'd had when we were talking on Tuesday about the whistleblower who was found shot dead in his car, one of the things, and this was, somebody tweeted this at me, I think Johnny tweeted this at me, which, you know, just appeared right away in our, you know, we had access to it immediately, was audio of this guy saying, I wouldn't fly in one of those planes. I wouldn't fly in a Boeing plane. And I wrote in my notes, imagine, I actually copied it. Imagine the disruption if folks started refusing to fly on Boeing planes. So you have the Boeing not delivering. So planes are going to, you know, reduce their service, switch to Airbus, whatever, which I think is European, which is kind of messed up. Uh, and then you might also have people not wanting to get on Boeing planes, especially if says stuff like that. But I had a tweet respond that it's about nationalizing air travel. And that would be quite controlling for the government. And Boeing would probably benefit from that because it's such a huge um, government contractor. So maybe they could make just as much money and produce fewer planes because there is pressure on, on one of, I think the Washington state factory, who knows what's going to happen to that. And, and remember when you see big companies, or I should say like, this is what I think when you see big companies doing things like that under pressure from the government and you think, well, it doesn't benefit them. Like who is the them in a big company? Well, it's the decision maker. And why can he normally not do something against the interest of the shareholder? because there could be legal repercussions. However, if he's getting pressure like this, public pressure or government immunity or government regulatory pressure, he he ha you know, yeah, he, he has to do that stuff. So you can have things against interest for the company getting done either because this guy needs to cover his own ass or maybe he will profit from it or both. But it's not always just the most obvious like, did the stock price go up? Did the stock price go down? A lot of these guys are playing the long game and a lot of these guys don't, you know, I, I would want to dig in and see if their interests, their personal interests as managers are strictly in line with the interest of the shareholder or the stock price or whatever. So yeah, that was weird. Um, I thought maybe Manukin would put together a consortium to buy Boeing because <laughs> the stock price tanked. I guess that's his new job. Uh, okay, so let's do some comments and then I'll go back to the Trump story. And a few little announcements before. Um, I have this True Hemp Science promotion going on. You know how I love True Hemp Science? Literally changed my life, like to. Uh, you know, the, the, there to, I don't know if it's unnatural to separate out CBD. However, that's my G30 alarm. Uh, however, there's just something about it. Takes the edge off, helps you relax. It does not get you high. The one I like anyway, the 25 milligram CBD gummies with a zero THC. Sleep great. I wake up feeling refreshed. I'm looking forward to trying Hypnotica. So that's a, a new product, which is great for the end of the day, I am told. So I'll tell you what I think about that. But if you want to try it yourself, go to truehempscience.com, use the promo code MONICA, and the first 100 customers to spend $80 or more gets a free sample of Hypnotica. And uh, the stuff is great. So I just, if you know anyone who thinks like wanted to try CBD, but it just didn't work for them, I'm confident like CBD is like truffles. I don't know if you've ever had a truffle. Like truffles can be pretty subtle, like a white truffle. So I've 
so if they see it like a rube like me come in, like a little urchin from Brooklyn come in, they'll give you a truffle they know is bad because they go bad very easily. And if they go bad, they don't really taste like anything. And if you don't know what a white truffle tastes like, you're it's like the emperor's new clothes. You're like, oh, this is delicious. And you paid a lot of money to taste something that you cannot actually taste. So, but who who's to know unless you know? So I feel like that's with CBD, like you can get CBD that just doesn't work. It's not processed properly or whatever. I don't know. But I think that is why people think it's not an effective um, natural product. And so I would just say try truehomescience.com if that's happened to you. And yes, please, you know, just subscribe to my stuff. Give me a little rating here and there. Uh, okay, let's do some comments if there are any. And, and then we'll come back to the rest of the stories. Let's see. All right. Hey, everybody. We've got Stuart. He's on the farm, but he'll be listening. That's I know it's Thursday because Stuart was the guy who had a feeling from my mom uh, when he was at the farm, which he's only at on Thursday. And that was he thought it might be my mom's birthday. But my mom's birthday had been the previous Thursday. And uh, my mom died that Thursday, a week later, and he felt her presence, said a prayer for her, reached out to me, and I hadn't told anybody. And he shared that information with our great community and uh, the Propaganda Report community on Discord. And I got so many um, just uh, messages of support and prayers. It was so super sweet. And speaking of my mom, I didn't plan this. I didn't know you were going to be here, Stuart. Uh, I'm wearing this cross. And I don't know if I told this story. I don't think so. I unearthed this cross and this miraculous medal during my move last year. And uh, I remember I got the cross from my sister, but I couldn't remember where the medal came from. And my husband, which is very thoughtful, got me this gold chain for Christmas to put the cross and the medal on. So I did. And I sent a picture to my sister who was with my mom. And I was like, hey, ask mom, mom, we call her mom. Asked mommy what, uh, where this miraculous metal came from. And she got back to me and said, well, the metal it was my sister, Bowie. <laughs> so I guess everybody has like weird names. I was baby. Um, the miraculous metal. She said, I don't know where the miraculous metal came from, but the cross was the first present your father ever gave me. I was 17. So that was 1946. And she had no idea where it had gone to. Uh, but she said she she wasn't crazy about it. It's quite beautiful. There's little like designs in it. She said because a Catholic cross has a Corpus Christi on it. So she thinks it's a Protestant cross. <laughs> but she was tickled that I found it and that I was wearing it. But anyway, so so I'll wear that. Even though I have to say, I always think it's like ashes on Ash Wednesday. Like what? what do people think of you? You know, it's like cast your pearls among swine. It's like, do you like, I don't know. I just get bad vibes in LA, like about stuff like that. And I just feel like, are you, are you literally, you know, putting stuff out there to be, you know, it stresses me out. But anyway, but I do love this very much. So I wear it. Uh, yes. You like my term new weather. You got to trade You got to put a little trademark. I trademarked that. You need to put the trademark on there. Um, oh yes, I have a friend, James, who, yes, that's true. He turned me on to the little generator that comes or that you can buy a solar panel with. It's called a Jackery. So I'm going to have to charge that up now that you mention this. Uh, they are using geoengineering. Oh, oh, interesting. Angus says even for the pier, there will be boots on the ground in Gaza disguised as contractors. Oh yeah, Kelvin. We've seen this movie a hundred times. It's a theater of war for good reason. Um, yeah, Angus says he doesn't think it has anything to do with the hostages. They just bomb indiscriminately. Yeah, I totally agree. I don't believe that. Uh, okay. Yep, the TikTok ban bill doesn't ban it. It just transfer owners to a silicon. Valley. Yep. Google, Facebook, share data or buy information, Angela says. 
And who is the U.S. government to decide who should own what? I totally agree, Angus. Uh, plenty of Chinese electronics to worry about if that's really their problem. It's the data. Kelvin says it's the data. 75% is American teens, and that is some valuable data. Ah, here we go. That's a thread we're going to have to pull on in a future episode. Banning or buying TikTok is a front for the Patriot Act 2.0. I feel like I did dig into the TikTok thing, but, you know, a lot of stories go in here and they don't, <laughs> some of them have to stop rattling around, some new ones go a rattle around. Oh, interesting. Angus said that his Air American flights yesterday, which are typically 737s, was an Airbus. Yeah. Um, and he's saying he is not flying on a 737 MAX 9. Uh, the tail is too long, for example. Anyway, so I am... Wow, this is crazy. There are plenty of videos, Kelvin says. Um, the way the 737 MAX is forced to land is, fa is much faster, and it isn't good because if they land like normal, the back end of the plane would impact the runway. Shanikes. Wow. Yeah, this Boeing thing, I mean, it does, it is not, it is not stopping. So very interesting, very interesting stuff. Okay, so we've got another story. Let's just hit that real quick about Trump. Trumpity Trump. Oh, I have like four more stories. <laughs> Shoot. Maybe I should do shorts with my extra stories. So in Georgia, a judge dismissed some of the Trump charges. Uh, I'm going to say without prejudice. So if your charges are dropped with prejudice, it means that they cannot bring the prejudice, bring the charges back against you. But he opened the door to bringing the charges back if they were corrected. He said that uh, now 35 counts remain, so don't get your, your hopes up. And if you want to know what the indictment is about, this is Georgia, that Fonnie Willis, is that how you say it? Filed an indictment against Trump and 18 co-defendants in August, alleging a criminal conspiracy that stretched for months across several states. The allegations, including planning to block certification of the election, gaining illegal access to voting machines, and pressuring local officials, including the Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, to overturn the results. That is like all, it is such an inversion because after I followed the Georgia election so closely and the aftermath so closely, like it, there was so much funny business down there. And it wasn't by Trump, it was by Raffensperger and that whole crowd. So this is the funny part though. This is like obnoxious. The defendants argued that the counts that were dismissed didn't fully detail which portions of the U.S. or Georgia constitutions they were accused of not upholding. The judge agreed, and listen to this like backwards <laughs> compliment or whatever, they do not give the defendants enough information to prepare their defenses intelligently, as the defendants could have violated the constitutions and thus the statutes in dozens, if not hundreds, of distinct <laughs> ways. <laughs> Uh, uh, the ruling is unlikely to be fatal to the case and the state has six months to bring back those charges if the prosecutors choose to reinstate them. So this just like those charges, just like the entire January 6th thing is complete inversion. And, uh, I'm going to go with one more story. I think at least, you know, uh, so I, this is another issue that I fear is going to be subject to an inversion by Pope Francis. But let's just start at the top, which is there's an article about the GOP um, changing its tack on abortion. Uh, they're going to say they're going to be very forward about their messaging on abortion. But as a little inset in the article on that, it talked about IVF. And it was saying, like, it's tricky for Republicans because, of course, they're pro-IVF because they're pro-family. And they need to be careful how they word when human life begins because it could mess up IVF. Well, that is not a consistent viewpoint. The, the consistent viewpoint is the Catholic viewpoint. In, in my opinion, I'll talk a little bit more about this, is that 
the Catholic Church is not only against abortion, it's against birth control, and it's against IVF because it's unnatural. So people who think a Catholic Church just wants more Catholics, that's why they're for birth con they're against birth control. It's not. They don't go for the unnatural stuff. That is the whole thing about their positions about sex and reproduction and everything. It's very simple. But uh, but you see that they were right because if you now have to do backflips around defining human life because you don't want to be responsible for the babies who are created through the IVF process, uh, you know, that reveals the inconsistency in the thinking. So I'm going to read from that inset and then I'm going to tell you how I think it should be worded, this idea about life. It says more than half of the GOP conference had signed onto a bill defining a human being as beginning at the moment of fertilization, cloning, or other moment at which an individual member of the human species comes into being. I have always thought the best way, and because I had an argument, a discussion with uh, a friend of mine, it was a, a fellow transfer student. He's an Israeli guy. I might have mentioned him before. He, I used to find him very interesting to talk to because he had a different perspective, but he was a thinking guy. And uh, he was very pro, like abortion and everything. And he was like, how can you believe in birth control and not abortion or like a condom? Like that's a violent interference with uh, the creation process. And like the Catholic Church would say, yeah, you can't. But my answer was that a fertilized egg is the unique genetic definition of a person and without any outside interference, the likelihood is that that person will emerge at, you know, fully defined that exact person is simply just going to grow from there. So I would say when the, when the individual is genetically defined, but this stuff about cloning, um, these unnatural things need to be really thought seriously about by you, by the person who's doing it, because these regulatory people, Anthony Fauci's wife is a high level, if not the highest ranking bio or medical ethicist in the country, as she was last time I looked her up. So they're the people who are deciding these ethical questions. So like, don't count on your doctor or the medical establishment or the government to tell you what's right and wrong in this stuff. And I'm not here to tell you, but I'm here to point out the things that you might want to seriously think about. Cloning is mentioned expressly. IVF, which I have I have um, been aware of the destruction of many embryos, but I've also seen a lot of birth defects because when my son was in preschool because he has Down syndrome, a lot of people there had had IVF. And I don't know why, if it's that they were older or what, I really don't know, but it's just something to think about. Uh, abortion, of course, euthanasia, like how hospice is treated, you know, be really scrutinize it, you know, be aware of it. mRNA, DNA injections, organ transplants. Think about what brain death means. That's a statutory term. That is, you know, not a natural expression. And maybe even gene editing. I don't know enough about it, but I'm just saying, think about these things for yourself. Like inform, consult, and follow your conscience on these things. And uh, I don't think the GOP needs to compromise on its definition of human life because they want IVF to be pro-family or whatever. And I heard Newt, I heard Newt Gingrich not that long ago, a couple of weeks ago kind of set the agenda there. He's like, well, Republicans are all going to be in favor of IVF. And I was like, really? I'm not, I'm not criticizing it. I'm just saying you need to think about it and don't, don't let them decide. This isn't like on a, on a platform, you know, don't, this, this is not your, your moral platform. This is a political thing. Um, yeah, but I'm afraid Pope Francis will invert the whole thing. Like, don't be obsessed about birth control and, oh yeah, you know, do IVF when there's no coherence of, in that thinking, except for just to be more liberal, to give more freedoms. But there, what we want from the church is guidance. So I would just suggest thinking about it seriously. 
Uh, what else? What else did I have here? Two quick hits. I'm going to give them to you. There was a big article about the international law of the seas in the journal that pops up every once in a while. There was a huge op-ed by Kissinger in there some years ago promoting it. It's a UN thing where they divvy up the seas and they're handing it out to people. And our guys are pressuring the U.S. to sign on because we can't get in line to get our allocation if we're not signatories. And they're also looking for funding for subsidizing for undersea mining of resources in untouched ocean water. And what I would say is don't treat this like the FCC treats airwaves which was wrong, property gets owned by, by the first user of this property in nature. If it's unused by anyone, that's how you get it used. So this is an inversion again, because what they're saying is we uh, decide we own it, the UN owns it, it can get rid of it, and then you know it can disseminate it. And then the US government was gonna give people money, tax dollars, so that's just you know no accountability there, no, cost benefit analysis, give it to them to exploit stuff that's probably very expensive to exploit. And they wouldn't, and it wouldn't happen in, in under natural circumstances. So, you know, this command and control stuff, yeah, it's that destroys the environment. I'm not in an environmental case, but I don't want the government subsidizing these projects that would not, that aren't necessary, that don't don't hit that marginal return that's necessary for a free market, a free people to venture into these, these new uh, you know, arenas. And then the last thing is Neil Young is back on Spotify. And he had left in the stink about Joe Rogan's discussion of uh, the vaccine, I think it was, disinformation. And it reminded me, and I'll leave you with this quote. I was reading these Grateful Dead books because my husband's a deadhead, and I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Hank Harrison was their handler. He's a CIA guy. He's the father of Courtney Love. So I was reading his book, Hank Harrison's book. He doesn't say, like, I'm a CIA agent, but he was just writing about the dead. I think it was like a multi-volume book, but but there's this is the quote I will leave you with. Or maybe para, para quote, <laughs> paraphrase. He said. You know, he always tries to remind the hippie chicks that censorship is worse than chauvinism. So anyway, do with that what you will. And thank you so much for listening. Tune in at four o'clock Pacific, seven o'clock Eastern. I'm going to talk to Danny Shaw about the Haiti situation. And you can uh, always tune in to this show on your favorite video platform, The Monica Perez Show, 2 o'clock Pacific, 5 o'clock Eastern, every Tuesdays and Thursdays for a great news roundup. Thanks for coming, guys.